one of the things that people don't understand that you have the benefit probably of recognizing is, well, in the SEALs and the Boy Scouts, like it's kind of right there in front of you. And then right. when you're in real life, excuse me, I don't want to use it that way. When you're in civilian life or if you're if you've never been in the military and you're out here in the world, it feels like you're on your own. But the truth is you're not. But you're going to have to invest time, effort, energy or money to build a team around you to help you move forward into what it is that you want in life. Now, part of what I think is really important in that is having clarity and understanding what it is that you want to accomplish. And you said one of the reasons why people will come out of the military and just kind of be stuck rudderless without in a boat is not having a mission any longer. Let's talk about this, this mindset about the SEAL mindset and, and this naked acronym that I know is a big part of your life and discovering this mission. Talk us through this journey of how you kind of went from that transition of, OK, life's a little chaotic to, ah, I'm going to be the one to create the mission now. So, and that's a great segue. So, you know, kind of like what I talked about before, you know, I, I went out and found coaches, business coaches. I decided after someone calling me out saying, Why don't you start your own CBD company, you know, all the business coaching out there, you know, the sort of high end, they're like, you know, you need a, you need a mission. You need a why. What is your why? And I've talked to some other people about this. And, and so I looked at my own journey uh, from like joining the, the military to transitioning out of the military. And then I'm like, well, I'm a veteran. I have some disabilities here and there. And, uh, and so let's see if what I'm starting, the CBD company, Naked Warrior Recovery, can help other people and maybe other veterans. And I look to, look, look to see like, how many veterans kind of suffer as they get out of the military. And when I was doing that research, I found that 22 veterans take their lives every single day. We've lost more veterans to uh, suicide than we have to 20 years of sustained combat. And this is, this, this is the 20th anniversary of, of 9-11. So we've lost more veterans to, uh, to suicide than 20 years of sustained combat. And, and I was kind of looking at this, you know, very recently and I was like, oh my God, my dad killed himself. My dad is one of those 22 a day. So our mission at Naked Warrior Recovery is, you know, 22 to zero. And, and like I said before, uh, CBD is a modality that, that helps me get there. It helps me every single day. It helps, you know, it helps with pains and other things that I have going on with my body, but it also helps turn off the noise in my head and get me from that hundred, that two, 210 down to like, maybe I'm like at a, a 110 now. Um, but, you know, the other part of it is, is mindset. And so I came up with the get naked mindset and what get naked is. And I love wearing shirts out there or a hat and people are like, what is get naked? And I'm like, it's really kind of about mental health and about thinking like changing your mindset. And so part of Get Naked is, is taking your ego off and being, you know, not being afraid to ask for help. Taking your ego off and finding that, he that healing and being a little bit vulnerable. Uh, the other part of Get Naked, Naked is an acronym. So the N is for never quit. Let me see if I can point to that on my shirt. So the N is for never quit. And I don't mean like never quit, you know, smoking or drinking or doing drugs or porn or whatever, whatever your vice is. I mean, if you start something, then you should, it's never quit on yourself. You should follow that thing all the way to the end. And I know it's hard and it could be unattainable. And many people think that SEAL training is unattainable, but you know how we do it in SEAL training is we go from one evolution to the next. And so Hell Week, I'll just use Hell Week as an example. Hell Week is five and a half days. It's, you get no sleep, but actually we slept for about two and a half hours during Hell Week. And, but they feed you four times a day because you're burning a lot of calories. You're running around, you're cold and wet and miserable and you carry this boat on your head. Uh, in your boat team. And, but all you have to do is like, it doesn't matter how bad it gets. They're always going to feed you. So all you got to do is make it to the next meal, or you just have to make it to the next evolution. You know that they're going to only keep you in that Pacific ocean, which the water's really cold. For those of you who don't know, Southern California, the water's cold, except for about two months out of the year. And, uh, and you'll be, you know, shivering, jackhammering completely, you know, lose total bodily function. And, and then, some point they're going to get you up and they're going to start running you around and warming your body core temperature up again. So all you're going to do is make it past that one thing. You just got to make it past the next evolution. You just got to make it to the next meal to get through that. And that's, that is all buds is. It's just like small victories. And this is something we also learned in, um, in like POW school. Like when I was a prisoner of war, like if, if the, if the interrogators were, uh, told you not to do something, if they said, don't look left, you know, when they're not looking at you, you totally look left. And maybe you want another little small victory there and you totally look right. And what when you achieve those small victories 
in your mind, you, you win every single day. So you just start stacking those wins. And that is such a huge, um, win for your mindset. Like when you like, dude, I'm a winner. Like I'm not losing at everything in my life. You know, it doesn't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter that I haven't eaten for a bunch of days. It doesn't matter that they don't let us sleep. It doesn't matter that I'm cold and wet and miserable. I won again and I beat you again and I won and I won for myself. And you stack those small wins, those victories. You know, people say that uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, but it was built every single day. And so you, you know, you just have to go out there and achieve those small victories every single day. It doesn't matter what you're trying to achieve. Just never quit. The end is for never quit. The A is accept failure. And we talked about failure a little bit earlier. And if you think about some of the biggest successes in history, you know, let's just say, uh, golly, I always forget his name. Um, Thomas Edison, that guy, he discovered 10,000 ways to not create the incandescent, incandescent light bulb. Uh, Elon Musk fired as a CEO from the first, uh, first company he started. Steve Jobs, same thing, fired from Apple. He started Apple, fired, and then, you know, failed, created another company, then came back to Apple and made Apple you know, one of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, Michael Jordan, arguably the best basketball player of all time. He has missed more than 9,000 shots in his career. He has, I think he's missed more than 29 game-winning shots. He's lost more than 380 games in his career. But still, you know what he would do after he failed? If he missed a shot, Game's over. Maybe he won. Maybe they lost. He didn't go celebrate. He went back and he practiced that shot that he missed every single hours. Just like go back to that spot, play it again, shoot, go back to that spot, play it again until he never missed that shot again. And so he took that failure as a learning uh, process. And so, you know, what I, what I like to tell people is failure is the foundation of success. So you, you know, you have this like obstacle in front of you, 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 maybe you fail and you fail and you fail. And then pretty soon you create this giant foundation of failure. All you have to do is hop over that obstacle and you're going to be successful. So accept failure. The K is kill mediocrity. And, and you know, we're surrounded by mediocrity every day. And, and, you know, I think mediocrity is kind of quitting on yourself a lot of times. And I'm certainly guilty of it. I've certainly had moments of like quitting on myself. You know, the first time I took the, the SEAL screening test, I quit during the test because I was like, oh, I'm so tired doing these push-ups. Now, when I look at it, I'm like, really? How did I quit during that? But I did. And so my mind wasn't strong enough. I wasn't ready for that at the time. And so, and so I have some regrets for that, but I also have, I'm, I'm grateful for that. But, you know, you know, we're surrounded by mediocrity every day. We can, you know, push a button on our phone and a car shows up, which is awesome. But we can also push a button on our phone and Amazon Prime delivers ice cream to our house in like 30 minutes or less. And, uh, so we're used to like scrolling and, you know, getting sucking into our phone and and just becoming mediocre and finding excuses to not do things that we need to do, like work out or get that project done or hit the snooze button in the morning and not getting up and getting after it. Um, so we have to kill mediocrity kind of in our own life and then we will achieve success. We'll get our mind right. We'll have purpose. We'll have mission. Um, the the E is the E is expose your fear. And I don't mean like, you know, the things that go bump in the night. I mean, the things that are living in the deep, deep back in the back parts of your brain in those dark places. Fear. I like to say fear is kind of like a vampire fear that it lives in the darkness and it sucks the life out of you. And, you know, really expose your fear. When I became brave enough to expose my fear to other people, my fear of failure, my fear of like what other people might think of me, all these other fears of looking weak and and, you know, not successful and whatever. Once I learned how to like reach back there in the deepest, darkest recesses of my mind and pull that fear out and expose it to the light, you know, those that fear turned into ash, but it didn't happen right away. It, like maybe I could only pull one out. And so a friend of mine who's also a business coach, his name is Sharon Srivatsa. Uh, he has a really cool technique for this. And he says fear does not exist on paper. And so what he does is he will, you know, maybe he's driving, he's started and sold many companies for billions of dollars and but he still has stress and anxiety and like fear of things and he says that he'll like pull over like things will start bugging him he'll pull over at a starbucks go order a coffee sit down with a pen and a piece of paper and and he will write down the things that are bothering him and when he looks and reads those fears those things that are bugging him he's like really that's what's bugging me 
because the fear does not exist on paper. It only exists in the back of your mind in that deep, dark place. So if you can expose the fear, you can control the fear and the fear no longer controls you. And the D of get naked is do the work because it all requires work. We can be lazy. We can be mediocre. We're not going to be successful. We're not going to move the ball forward. We're not going to improve where we are. It doesn't matter if you, you know, if you're working out and you put one more pound on the bar. If you're losing one pound or a half a pound or an ounce, it doesn't matter. As long as you're making progress and moving forward, that all requires work. But as you, you can't, you can't be successful. You can't get your mind right. You can't change who you are for it to be better if you are not willing to do the work. So it, the, the D is do the work. So it's never quit, accept failure, kill mediocrity, expose your fears and do the work. And that Mike is really- Rob. The mindset of a of a Navy SEAL, you know, it's kind of five secrets to to think like a Navy SEAL. I think that's everything, but how do you do that? And what I want to do is approach this from a practical way because so many people are stuck, right? And they're like, I can't, I shouldn't, I don't know if I can. What does Tim bring to the table to help create that reframing for people? What I bring to the table is what I learned from my therapist to start with, Dr. Helen Mendez who taught at USC, she's now deceased, but she literally changed my life. Um, first time I saw her, I was 30 years of age and she really took me to a process that me and her ended up creating together. The number one, you have to become awake. And the whole idea is sometimes we sleepwalk through life and you have to become awake. And then secondly, you have to take inventory but this is like, this is from one of the top psychologists in the world saying this. This is not just some motivator saying like, got to take inventory. But, you know, she had some depth to what she was saying. So you have to become awake. Secondly, you have to take inventory of like, where are you really? So you like to go by Michael? Is that what you go by? Yes, please. So Michael, with your life, when you were going through what you were going through, you had to go like, whoa, that was pretty whack. Like she injured me. That was pretty whack. Look what she did to me. Look what she said to me. So that's like taking inventory, be realistic about where we're at, right? So you become awake, got to take inventory. Number three, and this is what you're doing on Unbroken, you have to partner with the right people. And this is where people miss it. You have to partner with somebody who's stronger than you, more knowledgeable than you in this particular area that you're trying to turn your son back into a comeback. Make sense? Yes. A lot of people in the past, they didn't have the right people to partner with. In today's world, man, we can go to a TED Talk. We can get somebody's book. We can get somebody's book on tape. We can listen to the Unbroken podcast. We can listen to Tim Story and 10X. So our lives can be changed in a different way. And it's all like attainable much more than it was, let's say, in the 60s, 70s, and even 80s. Yeah, I, I think that's very true. I, I think about my life and my trajectory going and hitting this massive rock bottom at 25 years old without personal development. I cannot imagine I would be where I am right now. And so I have so much gratitude for people like you and Oprah and Tom Bilyeu and John Lee Dumas and who have put together these this knowledge, this wealth of information for us. But something came to mind as you were speaking that I recalled that you, you've mentioned before that I want to dive into because, A, I believe that you're spot on and I totally agree with you, but I think that people fail to nourish that. And you said something that has held true in my life for a very long time. He who works his land shall have abundance. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the parlay in that experience and in that growth? Yeah, and it really goes with these points. So you have to come awake, take inventory, partner with the right people. But your land is what's in front of you. Okay, so like with, with Michael's land, as a 25-year-old who found out you were in a set, in order to get out, you had to become awake, take inventory, and partner with people. So let's say people then gave you advice. Okay, you're struggling with addiction. This is what you need to do. You're struggling with self-esteem, self-worth. This is what you need to do. So your land is what's in front of you. Now, little did I know that this proverb that I got from the Bible would echo all over the world through the voice of Tim's story. 
because this is what I'm really known for. And now I've been to 76 countries of the world. And soon it'll be 79 within the next four months. And he who works his land is Proverbs 12, 11, shall have abundance. But whoever chases fantasies lacks wisdom. That's Proverbs 12, 11. To work your land means you got to plow the ground. You got to plant the right seed. You got to water the seed. Then you'll get the harvest. Michael, everybody wants a harvest without the plow, 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 plant, 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 water, water, water. Then you get the harvest. How powerful is that? You got to plow, plant, the water, then you harvest. What would you say to those who hear this and they look out their door and they say, well, my land is barren and burned? Well, I would say, number one, that I understand that. Because it could be they were abused. It could be they lost everything because of a setback. It could be they have cancer. It could be they're struggling with anxiety, mental illness. So I'm not giving quick solutions here. I mean, I'm the guy that gets in the trenches with the biggest celebrities in the world. And, um, and when I'm with these people, male and female, I'm not always trying to give fancy answers. I'm just like sitting in the, in the, in the crap with people. That's my story. But when they're ready to hear, then I do believe this. I believe that life will make a way where there seems there is no way. And you look at where Oprah Winfrey started, abuse, early pregnancy by her, losing a child. Um, feeling unorthodox, trying to find her way. And she is one of the most well-known person on the planet from Mississippi. She was hurting in Mississippi. Now one of the most well-known people on the planet. So you never know what's going to happen if you're willing to cooperate and plow the ground, plant the seed, water the seed, and reap the harvest. Sometimes you got to see things that are not there yet by faith. What kind of role has being transparent played in your life? Because I'm, I'm obviously getting that tremendously here in this conversation, but, but how does that play it over into the other aspects of your life? Yeah, so definitely being transparent is a big one for me. And the most personal example, like dear to my heart for me, why I do, I've got a million examples, but the one that's definitely most relevant in my life and that kind of came full circle for me is in my family, my grandma was very open about our condition. She always did kind of like, you know, um, not experimental, optional procedures. That's the better word. Optional pr procedures to develop research for our condition. And she always reached out to support groups. That was her thing. And she rubbed that off on me. I'm not going to lie. Because when, I, when she used to take care of me, that, that resonated with me. And she really liked that. And then, you know, her sister had it. She was kind of the opposite. And in my family, you know, we say like, my mom was more of an Aunt Rodney, my grandma's sister, who was a little more quiet about it. And, you know, it's, it's tough things to talk about. I definitely understand that. But for me, it was like this thing that was kind of half talked about in my family. It wasn't really fully talked about, especially not on the other side of my family that wasn't affected by it. You know, they always knew we had something and they respected it, but it was never really talked about. And so for what my mom specifically, she was always kind of the type never to, to like talk about it or be more open with it. She was a little more pleased with her own, with our condition. And then as I started to be more open and accepting of it, she became more open and accepting of it as the years went on. So then, you know, I eventually, you know, I think it was like 20, when I was 23, 24, so like two, three years ago, or 2019 is when my grandma got sick. And she had a uh, terminal cancer. Uh, it was unrelated to FAP, which is, was, what was her wish. That would have been pretty devastating for her. But, um, I remember towards the end, we, you know, we were having heart to hearts and whatever, whatnot with her. And my grandma told my mom that, you know, she needs to get tested, you know, for, you know, get her a stroke test to make sure that she's okay. And she basically said, you need to do this for Michael because Michael didn't give up on you. You can't give up on it. And that's what my grandma said to my mom. And then, so my mom went and she got her stroke test. My mom has a very complicated medical history, so to not go into detail, especially since I'm not really 100% sure, we're still not all 100% sure, but they found something that they had to remove and they had to do a reversal to what she had done to her to what I knew, which five years ago we were told wasn't possible, right? So they find something 
And this test was obviously done. So we find out that my mom's going to have to have like two to three operations over the course of like the next year. And that year just so happened to be the pandemic. So actually my mom's last operation came in March of 2020. She was still in the hospital and had to get whisked out with all the craziness going on in New York City. So that was a very, very dramatic time. But the point being of the story is my mom got that test done because my grandma told her to, because of, you know, how I chose to be transparent and open with everything, because my grandma basically told her, you know, you can't give up on my goal because that's the route I chose, right? So my mom would have been a Ronnie and not gotten her test done, but she did get her test done and they found it and she was able to be safe because of it. And I remember during the pandemic, you know, when I was taking care of my mom, cause I had to send her home early cause of all that craziness. She still had like tubes in and I had to take care of whoever. But like, you know, the operations went well and I just had to play home nurse for a little bit. So when I was playing home nurse with her, you know, we kind of had a conversation and we were saying like, you know, if I hadn't been so open, what would have happened? And you know, mom's like, honestly, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't think we would be in this position right now, you know, that she would be here and we would all be here in this position. And that's just one example where my mom's life was impacted by I and mean, I don't know if you could say saved, but she at least went to do that that test was, which is something she swore she would never do, never do. She swore that she would never get operated on again. And she went through three surgeries again. And, you know, in a way it was a full circle moment in my life too. Cause I remember when I was, I was at school and this was happening. And I remember on the day of her six hour surgery, and I was a nervous wreck because I was checking the clock. I had a friend come up from, from school to hang out with me to keep my mind busy that day. But for the first time, I was kind of in her shoes when I was under the knife, you know, like I was clock watching and really scared and concerned. And like, I knew, I knew my mom. So I knew that, you know, she always said in the past that she would never get operated on again, you know, or a religious family. She said, well, my time comes, my time comes. And she was at peace with it. And, you know, she said, I got, you know, 40 good years after my surgery, you know, that, that was her, her view and then her view changed. And, you know, now she went through with all the things that she said she would never do again. She went through with going under the table again and getting operated on. She lived a couple months with an anastomy bag, which was temporary, but in between surgeries, again, another thing she swore she would never do. So I was kind of worried. I said, like, okay, now the surgery is good. And my dad called me and said, everything went well. It's like, okay, now I know the recovery is coming. So I just, I was worried if she was going to be up for the task mentally, right? Because that's what she was worried about me. And then in a way, I was kind of like her, you know, I was like worrying about her well-being when she was worrying about mine, but then I kind of saw her kind of handle it like a champ, you know, like she, she gave me no reason to worry. She took care of it. She really did. I, I checked up on her and called her at school. She was in good spirits and she gave me no reason to be concerned. So that's kind of how I would imagine she felt when I started doing what I was doing. Right. Because that took a, a huge weight off my shoulders because I was like, okay, she's going to be good. Right. Like. I see that she's handling it well. I see that she's going to be okay. And that I was able to exhale. And then in that moment, it was kind of full circle for me. Cause I was like, this must have been hit. This must be how my parents felt when I was under, you know, and just to kind of see that the, the parents took all those years ago when all these things happened, you know, I had a bunch of pads I could take back to take the silent route and not talk about this and do the thing that my family had been doing, or I could take a different route and be open about it. And that could, you know, me. That was like the mystery route, you know, you never really know where that's going to lead. There needs, you know, the other one you do, but it's a little more predictable in bad ways. So I just kind of, I made the choice of being fully transparent because it just gave me more, it added more meaning to my life with, it, it deepened my relationships within my family, number one. And I think that's obvious with just my parents and my immediate group around me in that story I just shared. But also for me, I think it's just helped me live a much happier, authentic life. Like I remember back when I was like 20, 21 and 22, those were like the years where like, I would tell some people, but not tell some other people. And I was like, in and out, you know, like I was kind of, I was in like a halfway where I was like, do I want to be fully open about this and really go with it? Or do I just want to only let certain people in on it? But then I, I learned through a series of like events in my job that I read about in the book at different jobs I had were like, I didn't tell people and they got something about me. And, you know, at one of my jobs, because I was in, you know, the bathroom once and it's like being pain, whatever, you know, standing on my feet, serving and all that. I had people who accused me and went to my owner, uh, the owner of the place I was working at the time and said, I was doing drugs in the pit. And they thought I was doing drugs. So that's, I was giving, by not being transparent about what had happened with me, talking about something that 
I literally had no control over, right? It's not like I chose to have any of this happen to me. It's not like this is no eight who I am as a person. So why is it a big deal? And then I kind of realized that that moment, like I was giving these people power to say I was doing drugs or to say I was doing this and to lie about me and make me look like a fool. And I realized when you're more transparent and open, you, you take that power back from people. You know, you take control. They can't do that to you. So that, that was the catalyst. Those two things were catalysts to make me go, you know what? Let's just be transparent because there's pros and cons to everything in this life. But the pros definitely outweigh the cons as far as being transparent as opposed to being negative.